Bears movie lovers, this is Aldo Gandia of the Bears Barroom Radio Network. I just want to formally welcome box office bros to John Tooch Santucci, Joe Goon Mandel produced show that's new to the Bears Barroom Radio Network. This is our first foray into providing you with programming that's outside of the Chicago Bears topic. But don't you worry, our priority will always be Chicago Bears radio programming. But we really thought that with movies being such a passion for many of us, that this would be a welcome addition to the network. We'd love to hear what you think of our expanding menu of shows and any suggestions you have about what you'd like to hear on the network. So let's get on with the very first episode of Box Office Bros here on the Bears Barroom Radio Network. A rescue op. Save the dinosaurs from an island that's about to explode. What could go wrong? Welcome to the Box Office Bros podcast, episode 10. Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom review. I'm John Santucci. Call me Tooch. I'm here as always with Joe Mandel, the goon. Joe, how are you? Hey, doing great, John. Ready to talk some movies. All right. Well, we have a very special guest tonight. We have two-time Emmy Award winner and founder of Bearsburn.com, Aldo Gandia. Welcome to Box Office Bros, Aldo. It is a thrill to be here, guys. I really love the show that you guys got, and uh, we're talking about a movie that I had high hopes for. <laughs> I'll give you my opinion on it in a second, but uh, talking movies with you guys is going to be a lot of fun. Thanks for inviting me. All and right. by the way, welcome to Bears Barroom Radio Network. This is awesome. Uh, oh, yeah. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, Bears uh, Box Office Bros. This is part of uh, Bears Barroom Radio Network as of tonight, our first show on Bears Barroom Radio Network. Uh, this is episode 10, and we we're talking about the fifth Jurassic Park movie. It's been 25 years, guys, since we first saw our first dinosaur in 1993. First movie directed by Steven Spielberg and based on the Michael Crichton novel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, go on the limb here and say I probably like this movie better than you guys. Uh, I, I had uh, very low expectations going in and was, you know, kind of pleasantly surprised, but like all of us are going to come to the conclusion that the film had some golden opportunities and didn't quite pull off uh, what they had set out to do. Sure. So uh, overall, Aldo, what did you think of Jura- Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom overall? Definitely a uh, summer popcorn film. If you want to kill two hours of time and for some thrills and some suspense, definitely worth watching. But as a lover of the Jurassic films, this one doesn't quite live up to my expectations, particularly because there's a young filmmaker named J.A. Juan Antonio Bayona, and I have high expectations for him as a filmmaker. He made the movie The Impossible, which was about the tsunami, the movie with Nicole Kidman, if you haven't seen that. Highly recommend that He made a couple of other movies that were uh, critically acclaimed so uh didn't didn't live up to my expectations but uh, we'll get into the details on why in a minute right and i think that uh you know all the thing all the films you mentioned were really good films and uh this is a good film it looks great uh the cgi the animatronics everything looks great it's very well directed very well acted but as we uh find out as we get later on in our conversation uh, it just fell short of uh, some of its uh, lofty ideas. Joe, overall, what did you think of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom? Uh, I was really disappointed, John. I got to say, I, I had high hopes going into this movie, and uh, it really let me down. It, it was one of those movies that, you know, the first act was very entertaining. The second act, I, I really enjoyed. And, and the third act of the film just kind of really brought it down for me. Uh, it was really kind of hard for me to get my grasp on it until about 20 minutes after I left the theater. But uh, overall, I was, I was pretty let down. Still, still a good movie, just, just not a great one. Right, and a lot of missed opportunities, and we'll talk about that in the spoilers section. Now, this is a second movie in a second trilogy. Again, like I said, it's the fifth movie of Jurassic Park, directed by J.A. Bayona, whose mentor was Guillermo del Toro, one of my favorite directors. Uh, Bayona's last film was uh, Monster Calls, with uh, Liam Neeson as a big monster uh, 
and uh, the monster. Uh, See a lot of uh, Guillermo del Toro's uh, influence, especially the set design, which uh, I thought was very well evident. And another thing I had going for it had a it had a great cast with some really good actors, including Chris Pratt, Bryce Dallas Howard, James Cromwell, Rafe Spall, Ted Levine, uh, Toby Jones, and a couple newcomers. We will talk about his opponent, Danielle Pineda and Justice Smith. While it was beautiful to look at and had enough action to, like Aldo says, uh, keep the popcorn flowing. Overall, what sort of grade are you guys going to give this movie, uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom? Uh, Aldo, what's your, what's your overall grade? I'm going to give it a solid C. Uh, again, excellent filmmaking. As you said, the visuals, the acting, all of it top notch. There's just a... a heck of a lot of ideas in this movie and none of them are, are fleshed out to really make for an intriguing st uh, storyline. I think if, if anything the problem with this movie lies more in the screenplay than it does with performances or, or direction and we talked about the Guillermo del Toro and uh, obviously Steven Spielberg's influence in this and then the previous, the, the filmmaker from the first trilogy these films, these uh, Jurassic World movies is a trilogy so this is the middle one and the first and third one are being directed by uh, the same person. I don't have his name in front of me, but right. I, you know his involvement in the movies just to me kind of signaled that there's too many chefs in the kitchen here. So I'm, I'm giving it a solid C. Right. That, that's probably my impression too, is that uh, a little, probably too many uh, chefs as Steven Spielberg and Guillermo del Toro are both consulted on this movie. Uh, Colin Trevorrow was the director of the first movie. And uh, he'll be directing the third movie, and uh, he really wanted uh, uh, Juan Antonio Bayona for this movie. He was a big fan. It just threw a bunch of great ideas out there, but didn't tie them all together. We'll talk about that later. Joe, what do you think uh, your, your grade's going to be for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom? Uh, I'm right on board with Aldo. I, I, I'm giving it a solid C. Uh, to me, it was it was just an average film. It it had a bunch of great set pieces. It had a great, lots of great CGI and animatronics and performances. But for me, it was almost like three separate movies. Like the first act was kind of an old school Jurassic World Park movie. Uh, the second act was kind of like a modern take on the old Jurassic World movie. And the third part of the movie was really like a, a monster movie mashed up with Jurassic World. And they almost kind of felt like they didn't gel together. And it was still a, a good time at the theater. But again, it just wasn't an amazing film. And I just had a hard time getting by some of those faults in the third act. I'm going to give it a B minus. I actually uh, like this movie a little bit more than you guys. All the missed opportunities were very frustrating. We're going to get into that in the spoiler section. I, uh, I enjoyed the acting. I loved the CGI and the animatronics, which I thought were very realistic. And to me, it was more a monster movie than Jurassic Park movie, and we'll talk about that uh, in the spoilers section. But before we leave, Joe, uh, tell uh, Box Office Bros podcast fans where we are when we next come back. Sure. So next week, the week of the 4th of July, we will be off. But the week after the 4th of July, we will be reviewing Marvel's next movie, Ant-Man and the Wasp. So... Keep it tuned in here, and we'll give you all you need to know about the next chapter in the Marvel Universe. And, man, that's going to be a good one, John. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Love the first Ant-Man. Uh, can't wait for that uh, discussion. So uh, moving on into the spoilers section. Spoiler alert! In addition to also talking about the ending, we also talk about the opening scene and how it sets the tone for the movie. Uh, so the opening scene for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom is the underwater fossil collection scene. And for me, it was a little bit disorienting because I kind of, you know, it was very fuzzy in the beginning. I know you saw, saw it in 3D, I saw it in uh, Standard. Um, I kind of didn't know where I was. You find the uh, two unknown characters, and, and you just know that uh, this is not going to end well. But uh, they're looking for uh, dinosaur DNA, which just happens in all the, you know, Jurassic uh, Park movies. Is uh, Dinosaur DNA is the goal of the movies. Uh, Aldo, give us your impressions of the opening scene. Well, we mentioned before recording that you saw the film on a matinee, uh, paid four bucks for it. I, I paid for the full 3D IMAX experience, paid $20 for it. <laughs> I wish I would have paid the $4 for it, particularly <laughs> because of that opening scene. Uh, it just didn't make really good use of the 3D, but that was my first impression after the first minute or so. But it quickly turns into a really great action sequence. 
I thought then after that opening sequence was done that this movie was really going to take off and, 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 and be worth t- t- 20 bucks. Lots of uh, excellent uh, CGI work in the beginning there. Lots of suspense, lots of uh, scares. And it, and it felt a little bit like the original Jurassic Park film that was directed by Steven Spielberg. So I thought, you know, overall, the film got off to a decent start. Right, you're on Isla Nubar again, which is the, the site of Jurassic Park, and you know it's raining, which happened a lot in the first movie. Remember we mm-hmm. had uh, uh, Newman from uh, Seinfeld. From Seinfeld. <laughs> he has his, his uh, escapade in the rain, which was a great scene. I'll never forget that scene. Absolutely, uh, great scene. It, that was kind of reminiscent of uh, that as well. And of course, I, like you said, I go to a four dollar and fifty show at nine thirty a.m. So I can. I'm going while my wife and the baby are asleep. So. <laughs> good, good God. <laughs> I can get back and my wife's not too mad at me. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Joe, uh, what did you think about the uh, claustrophobic opening scene and uh, the, the uh, uh, action piece at the very, very beginning of the movie? Oh, man, I, I thought it was great. You know, the whole time that little submarine was on the screen, I'm just waiting. I'm like, when is that giant dinosaur fish going to eat these guys? Because I, I can't wait to see it. And you know, and you know, they, they got the they got the dinosaur tooth and they got it out. And you know, you know, as soon as that happens, these guys are, are dino dino chow. And uh, yeah, that was that was great. And, and can we talk for a second about the guy that was trying to escape and he's getting on the helicopter ladder and and just when you think the dude's in the clear, he gets mm-hmm. chomped. And I. I don't know if you I don't know about you guys, but this is the first time I ever laughed hysterically when someone got eaten <laughs> by a dinosaur. Yeah, it was a great scene. Uh, uh, out of the frying pan into the fryer. <laughs> so, uh, we go straight from there. Jeff Goldblum is uh, testifying in front of Senate, in front of the Senate, I believe, and uh, where Jurassic Park is located is about to be destroyed by uh, a volcano. And the debate is whether or not these animals uh, should be saved or that we should let nature. You know, take the animals down with them, as happened uh, many thousands, millions of years ago with the real dinosaurs. And uh, Jeff Goldblum, who's, who's, I was disappointed he wasn't in it very much. He's really just two scenes of him testifying. That opening scene uh, where he's testifying in front of a congressional meeting sets the theme up for the movie, as you mentioned and I thought he was great, and it's good to see him back. He, he almost should be a fixture of this franchise. He, and he's talked about a lot in, in previous movies, but you don't see him. But this time, he, he has two excellent scenes. I would have loved to have seen more of them. Yeah, that was one of the wasted opportunities. Uh, you know, it did have a great cast. That was one thing that was going going for it. And uh, uh, the uh, one of the missed opportunities, of course, Jeff Goldblum, great actor, just... Uh, didn't uh, didn't have enough screen time for me. Uh, what do you think, Joe? I I knew it from the second they had him in all the trailers. I'm like, they're using all his screen time in the trailers, man. I think <laughs> I, I I think overall he was in the movie for like four minutes long. I you know, and and I said this earlier to you at work, John. I think this is the movie you make to get to the sequel, and. And I think that Jeff Goldblum and maybe the original three, uh, Laura Dern and Sam Neill, all return for the sequel. So maybe maybe that's what's in the pipe next. Well, well that would be something. That would be uh, something to see if, if uh, the returning characters. I think that would that would really wrap it up nicely. So from there, you know, we have uh, of course you know protests over you know save the dinosaurs and then some of the themes in this movie. Uh, one of them that that they explored, of course, was animal rights and cruelty to animals, tampering with nature, and ethics. Claire Deering, who's played by uh, Bryce Dallas Howard, and she is a member of the Dino Protection Group, which, uh, <laughs> Aldo, uh, what do you think of uh, the name they came up with for uh, Claire's organization? Quick, give me a name for the protection group that <laughs> Claire is heading. How about the Dinosaur Protection Group? <laughs> I think it took them about 10 seconds to come up with that name. Not very right. true. It's like, we didn't, we didn't have a name. Let's quick... You, hey, you over there, come up with a name for this group. Of all the ideas that they, they, they stuffed into this movie, you think they would have taken another minute or two to come up with a better name? <laughs> right, and of course, Claire's very active. She wants the, the dinosaurs to be saved. We'll talk about her conflict at the end of the movie. But yeah, she, she's, of course, uh, contacted uh, by the Lockwood Estate, and they are funding uh, a rescue mission to uh, Isla Nubar. 
which of course is uh, a Hawaii, you know, and uh, all the scene where all the helicopters fly in, you have waterfalls on either side of the valley. That's actually YPO Valley in Hawaii. I've been there a couple times. I was there in February. It's absolutely beautiful. And that's the Hawaii, the big island stands in for uh, Isla Nubar. The second act takes place on the island. Uh, but before we go to the island, uh, Claire knows that she has to uh, enlist Owen's help. Owen Grady is played by Chris Pratt. And uh, I, I, I don't know what you guys, but I, I've been a little, uh, I've had a little bit of Chris Pratt overdose. But uh, Joe, what do you think of Chris Pratt in this movie? Uh, he was fantastic per usual. You know, he he's a great leading man. He kind of, he makes me laugh constantly, but he also has the acting chops as well. So uh, I, for me, I, I can't overdose on the guy, at least not yet. Uh, I can't get enough of him. For me, he, he is Hollywood. And I can't wait to see more movies with him. So uh, I can't get enough of the guy. Right. And I, uh, I, I mean, I like him. He's physical enough to carry the role. Aldo, what do you think? I, I like him as an actor. I haven't overdosed on him yet. I'm just uh, uh, sad that we didn't have him do more in this movie in terms of providing more depth to the character. I would have loved to have seen the relationship between his character and the Bryce Dallas Howard character, Claire Daring. I would have liked to have seen that relationship develop. I would have loved to have seen a, a love scene with them, at least them clutching and showing some uh, some affection for one, for one another, but that just never develops. And I think that when you're dealing in a movie with CGI animals and, and, and all of a sudden you find yourself caring more about the, the death of a dinosaur than you do of the characters in a movie or the affection between one of them, I think you have a problem. In fact, well, we'll talk about this later, that closing shot of what happens at Isla uh, Nublar, it, 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 it was starting to, I think, trend on Twitter. People were so sad about the death of this uh, dinosaur, and nobody really cared about the characters in this movie. <laughs> Yeah, and that was a golden missed opportunity. Was you know we would have liked to you know uh, they did have one uh, kiss, but I mean yeah, their romantic uh, relationship could have been really uh, developed in mind for uh, you know to make the uh, the tension of the movie you know pay off that much better. But uh, exactly, yeah, you, know, you, you do get uh, Owen's relationship. Really, you get to see Owen's uh, re- relationship with Blue developed instead, <laughs> which, uh, right. which while that was great, you know, boy and his dog, but. Uh, uh, you know, we, we we could have had both. You know, yeah. uh, you get to see all the you know the the scenes of him training little blue as a as a as a, a juvenile or baby uh, yeah. dinosaur. That, that was really cute, and cool, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, that was cool. sets it up. And uh, of course, you know, uh, there's uh, Chris Pratt's able to deliver a great line where uh, when she when she uh, talks him into going with her uh, to the island again, uh, he says, "Remember, if I don't make it back from this." It's all your fault. <laughs> I thought it was a great line, and you know, Chris Pat delivers those lines all the time, and that's why we like his, uh, we like him, his movies, uh, mm-hmm. love him in, in Gardens of the Galaxy. They do make it to the island, and that, that's the uh, second uh, act, which is uh, you know the uh, journey to rescue the uh, the mission to rescue the uh, animals that are joined by uh, two helpers who are t- uh, two great kid actors, uh, Danielle Pineda, who plays Zia, the paleo veterinarian. And Justice Smith, who plays Franklin, and he is the uh, computer communications expert. Uh, Joe, what do you think of their performances? Oh, uh, they were they were the standouts for me, really. I mean, Danielle Pineda was was so good, and you know, I bought every second of her on the screen, and she kind of had like this fierceness to her character that I didn't expect, to be honest with you. I thought she in the beginning of the movie, I just thought she was going to be like some another character, but she was just so fierce and a great. Uh, great job working with all those animatronics because she had to deal with the animatronic raptor the, the most of that movie. So that was very cool. And then for me, Justice Smith was fantastic. He's hilarious. Really funny kid who's going to be a huge star in Hollywood. He actually just got cast in another huge movie. Uh, they're going to be making the Detective Pikachu movie. It's going to be a Pokemon film and it's going to be live action mixed with CGI. So that's going to be a huge film for him. Kid's going to be a humongous star. Right, and, uh, I, I agree. They were both really good. When Owen and Claire uh, get to the island, they very quickly find out that it's not really a rescue mission. And this is one of the themes that uh, they explored in the movie, and that was uh, the weaponization of uh, 
of these animals, you know, weapons for profit to the, the theme of greed, uh, which we find out is, is the, the actual true, uh, conflict of the movie. And, uh, uh, we find uh, one character, veteran character actor, Ted Levine there who plays Wheatley, the, uh, general who's organizing, uh, the mission. And, uh, Aldo, what do you think of, uh, Ted Levine's, uh, Ted Levine's performance? I love Ted Levine. He, uh, of course, played Buffalo Bill in Silence of the Lambs. It took me a few minutes to recognize him, and I yelled out, hey, that's Buffalo Bill! <laughs> it's a seizure. Uh, he's just a great character actor. You know, he's, he's a, I think he uh, was born and raised here in Chicago. I know he, he worked at Steppenwolf and, and worked with John Malkovich here, and uh, his first big role was the Silence of the Lambs film, and he's had a really nice career playing the bad guy, and he continues that in this movie. Right, uh, he was yeah, he was really excellent. Of course, he carries around his life scripts with him, and he just knew that he was he was in for a bad ending with those life scripts. <laughs> oh, yes. for sure. Of course, he was collecting the teeth of all the animals. Uh, he was the baddie. Of course, the, the 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 one of the baddies, the main baddie, was played by Rafe Spall as Eli. I thought he did a really great job too. Uh, Joe, what would you think of Rafe Spall's performance? He was so menacing. And mm -hmm. I think the best thing about it was how he went from one extreme to the other. Because in the very beginning of the movie, when he brings Claire over and he's pitching her on this mission, he's like the nicest guy in the world, like a dude you want to hang out and have a beer with. And then towards the end of the movie, you just see how terrible of a person he really is. And, you know, the fact that he wants to unleash all this terror on the world, at the end of the day, he can act like he's a nice guy and then turn it on with the flip of a switch. That was really something to see, and he was fantastic in this movie. He had some great suits, too, Aldo. <laughs> yeah, very snappy dresser. You know, I, I don't recall having seen uh, this actor. I was really impressed with his performance. I thought he played a great bad guy. Now I'm looking over his film credits, and he was in uh, The Life of, uh, of, of Pi. Um, I just don't recall him being in that movie. It's an excellent movie, but yeah, he's a, he's a, he plays a really good bad guy. He's somebody to keep an eye on. Race Spall is the, is the pronunciation. I, do I have that correct? He actually gets top billing in a Netflix movie called The Ritual, which I really suggest you watch because it has a very unique uh, plot and plot twist. It's, it's a great story about some uh, hikers who do a hike in honor of their dead friend through uh, some mystical Scandinavian, uh, like trail and uh run into some interesting uh things on their journey so i, I suggest the ritual on netflix uh to get a chance to check it out with definitely do that. the great scene where they're uh avoiding a stampede in a in a uh a bubble kind of basically yeah. uh, that was a great scene uh joe what what do you think of the action in the second uh, act the second act for me was the best part of the movie it was you know all this great escape there's different escape stories going on there's chris pratt escaping in a different way you know when he's his limbs are incapacitated and he's waking up and trying to escape the lava and, and it was funny with the typical chris pratt kind of way and then you have claire and franklin trying to escape from that locked in cellar and man it was just a there was a lot of suspense and it was and it, i could really see the elements from guillermo del toro's influence here because there was that dinosaur coming out of that pipe with the with the lava behind it kind of like lighting up and you can see its shadow and it was very spooky kind of in that part and you know after they got out of that little hole and escaped and were running it kind of got more lighthearted and action packed with explosions and awesome CGI but uh, overall for me that was the most fun I had in this movie yeah, and if you're going to see it in 3D IMAX, this is that this is the scene where where it earns its money, where it earns the 20 bucks I paid, uh, because the the lava that's flowing out of the volcano really looks good in, in the 3D IMAX. Right, and the animatronics were great too. Uh, I know there's a, a scene with uh, Danielle Pineda where she says uh, that she uh, really thought the animatronics or the dinosaurs were almost lifelike, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the, the dinosaur skin felt real. The dinosaurs sweat. Their eyeballs moved, and uh, so that was really, really amazing. Was the animatronics, and uh, they spent a great deal of money on the movie. 150 million dollar budget. This opening weekend, it made 170 million, I think, Joe. So uh, it took in 700 million worldwide this weekend. So that's really impressive. 
not bad for a movie that uh, the critics were not <laughs> in love with, <laughs> but it's always the audience that that counts, and uh, audiences just love this this action picture. You know, I was thinking earlier that this was the kind of movie where if you haven't seen any of the Jurassic Park movies, then you probably would love this movie because right. if you've seen them all, then you, you just almost get the sense that all the the, the frights and the, the chills and, and, and that you've just seen it before and that's one of the problems with the movie and, and, and from a guy who has watched all of these movies you, you would have loved to have seen just more depth to the plot line agreed no doubt right that's a great point yeah it's uh it, you might like the movie more if you hadn't seen it is you know uh, any of the Jurassic Park fans may probably be a little bit uh disappointed and uh as an escape from the island you know there's a thrilling scene where they the boat is pulling away without them you know and these are the kind of thrills you got in this movie which uh you know it wasn't a terrible movie you know it had it had its moments and as you get to the third act which i which i liken to uh a frankenstein story you come to mm-hmm. the uh the lockwood estate in northern california and uh, i wanted to ask joe joe is that is that the ex professor xavier's uh Home for Mutants. <laughs> it, sh- it sure looked like it, John. It really did. Yeah, I think it was. I mean, I think they're like recycling that uh, estate. So whoever whoever owns that uh, that beautiful uh, mansion uh, and is uh, make a lot of money for uh, films. Have yeah. had the film crews in. <laughs> so, but uh, this is a part. Uh, the third act, of Frank, uh, of the X Mansion serves as the Frankenstein's castle, where. Uh, you know, of course, uh, genetic experiments are going on, and these are some of the some of the themes you know that we were talked about that kind of are thrown out there. They're great ideas; they just aren't kind of brought all the way home. The third act, I thought, had a beautiful set piece. That the mansion from the outside doesn't look as big as it is uh, when you see the inside of it. And uh, uh, there's, of course, the finale on the rooftops. It looks like it can't possibly be the same building, but uh, those are the kind of things you get with. Uh, with the, you know, uh, J. A. Bayona, Guillermo del Toro movies, you know, they're beautiful set piece, beautifully constructed. They look gorgeous. Uh, there's a great scene where uh, the uh, the Indoraptor, which is the, the the soldier dinosaur, and that was one of the themes they they built uh, one dinosaur a prototype of uh, a dinosaur soldier they plan to uh, make into a fighting machine. Right. And uh, that's that, that uh, dinosaur creeps into the the uh, uh, bedroom of a uh, little girl, Maisie. And that was uh, a really thrilling scene, of course. Uh, that was uh, out of one of Bayona's nightmares. He said that he recreated a, a nightmare scene with a clawed hand coming in through the window. Uh, what would you think of the third act, Aldo? I, I was a little disappointed with the third act. I thought that this would be where J.A. Bayona would ha- do his best work, given his uh, relationship with Guillermo del, del Toro, given his previous work, he did the film called The Orphanage. I, you know, I, I'm not complaining about what was up there on the screen. It was just that my expectations weren't met for something bigger and better. Uh, so I, I'm kind of nitpicking here a little bit. My biggest fault with the film is more with the themes and the ideas and too many ideas and Things aren't just played out to fruition, and, and, and the relationship between the two lead characters it isn't developed. Uh, so, when you ask me about this, this third act in this gothic setting, I'm nitpicking when I say I, I wish that there would have been more frights, more suspense in, in that in that sequence, in that scene, in that third act. Right, and you get you get an auction, you know, with uh, arms dealers from around the world, you know, bidding on all these different dinosaurs, and there never was any rescue. It's all about money. It's all about greed. The, the uh, auction is quickly disrupted. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. You know, that was fun. Uh, that was fun. <laughs> fun seeing buyers are tossed around, in the yeah. room, and uh, the audience, of course, is getting a a good uh, laugh and thrill as all these, you know, evil people are uh, getting their come up. And James Cromwell, who plays Lockwood, we find out that uh, and there's a character we never we met yet, Joe, uh, in the first uh, right. uh, movie and in the books, of course, the uh, Jurassic Park created by uh, Hammond and Lockwood. Hammond played by Sir Richard Attenborough. Lockwood played by James Cromwell. And we, find, we finally meet him. And uh, the rumor was that Hammond and Lockwood had had a falling out. Yeah, uh, they made this great creation and uh, couldn't handle, you know, the 
the, the consequences. So, uh, so, so Hammond and Lockwood had a long rumored fallout, and when we find out the reason for that in, in this film, and and that's because Lockwood, uh, his daughter passed away from a car crash when she was ten years old, and he cloned her. And in this movie, we get to meet Macy, who is an exact clone of her her mother, which to me was a baffling choice because this character. I don't know about you guys. For me, she just didn't have a purpose in this film. Like, they inferred the entire movie that we kind of knew who she was, and they kind of, like, hinted at it. Like, I thought maybe it was, like, Laura Dern's daughter from the previous one of the previous movies or one of the younger kids from another movie. But when it wasn't related to anyone, I was just kind of baffled. And it just seemed like a really strange choice, as she didn't really do anything for the plot. Right, you find out that she's the clone of, Lo- of Lockwood's daughter, so that brings up the other theme we're talking about that, uh, holy crap, they've, they've got the technology to clone humans, you know, and, and that's something that, uh, you know, uh, we've been waiting to hear ever since they cloned Dolly the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what would you think about the clone idea? I mean, it was, it's a great idea. They did kind of develop it. Uh, what would you think? This, to me, was the, the biggest sin of the movie and not further developing uh, this whole concept about human cloning. You know, Everybody falls in love with the raptors, but here you have a little cute girl, and nobody seems to show much love for her. James Cromwell, uh, Lockwood's character, kind of yells at her to go to bed when she comes with news, important news about something that she overheard. And, you know, this to me just should have really been played up. You should have really felt for this little girl and then spring the surprise that she's a clone. It's just a huge missed opportunity. Yeah, I agree too. That's uh, one of the, one of the many missed opportunities of this movie, and yet it, it looked it looked so good. It was so well directed. It was so well acted. It had enough action that uh, for me, that's kind of why I didn't think it was as bad as you guys thought. Although uh, I don't think you need to see it in the movie theater. I think you can wait till it comes out on Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think you'll have just as good a time. Uh, so we get to the finale, uh, and of course, uh, the dinosaurs are in danger of uh, being gassed while in their cages and Owen and Claire who were you know so ant- so uh, so much against these dinosaurs being left to die in east of the new bar decide to let them die in the in their cages you know as cyanide gas is leaking uh, which I thought was kind of contrary to their characters and I know you guys both want to uh, talk about that what did you think Joe you know I was actually okay with that decision because I thought of it I thought of it this way if it was me and I had to decide to let dinosaurs back into the world, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't want that decision on my shoulders. So uh, I'm okay. I would have done the same exact thing. I would have let them just die there because who do, who am I to let dinosaurs roam the earth? You know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, Aldo, what did you think of uh, the decision that Claire and Owen had to make at the end of the movie? I thought that was the first sane, sensible decision they've made. Yeah. <laughs> let, let these animals pass. I mean, ha- after having gone through what they did in Jurassic World, the first movie, and then after what they went through in this movie, you would think, ah, you know, maybe we should, you know, maybe it is a good idea to let them die. And that's the decision they made, and it was a good decision. Uh, uh, but I-, I can see why you disagree with that, John. Right, of course, uh, Macy, the the, uh, the young girl, decides to save them all, you know, as a kid just wants to do, you know, can't watch the animals die. Well, and the and fact that, that she's a clone also. Right, so. and the fact that she's yeah. a clone, you know, that's, these are these are all uh, ideas that are that, that are that were great, that could, that could have been uh, mined further, which uh, I think was the true uh, failing of the movie, which is a shame, because uh, it had a lot going for it, you know, it just uh, fell flat. Now, uh, at the end of the movie there was a post credit scene. I'm hoping you guys stay to the end. And oh, yeah. post credit scenes. I know you want to talk about it, Joe. So. Oh, man, I, I loved it. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm a huge Vegas guy. I love going to Vegas a couple times a year. And when that final screen cut to the Eiffel Tower at Paris, Las Vegas, and you see those pterodactyls landing on top of it, looking out across the street at the Bellagio fountains going off, I got so excited. It actually almost redeemed some of the movie for me because I was so excited because it kind of gives you an idea of where they're going with this last movie, and it's going to be a huge blockbuster. I, I can't wait to see what they do. Right. So, Aldo, uh, what do you think of the post credit scene? 
Yeah, I think it's definitely worth the wait. You got about 15, 20 minute credit sequence. I advise anybody that, you know, have a good book handy. You can read the book waiting for that closing scene, but it's definitely <laughs> worth it. It's just beautifully shot. There's all these flying raptors uh, on top of the uh, Paris Hotel, I think it's it, it's called, in yeah. Vegas. It just, and it just looks gorgeous. It's an excellent tease for the third film and, and probably one of the highlights, if not the highlight of the entire movie. Right, like we were talking about, we're hoping we'll have uh, some of the returning characters. Uh, For sure, you know, in, in the final movie, I think that'd be great if they could bring back, you know, some of the people from the original one from 25 years ago. And then uh, one final thing that uh, Aldo, that Joe and I have been talking about is uh, is Hollywood running out of ideas. Joe and I probably 80 percent to 90 percent of the movies that we've reviewed have been sequels or uh, derivative. And uh, is Hollywood running out of ideas, fresh ideas, Aldo? You know, I don't think so. I think what they're running out of is guts. You know, they spend so much money on these blockbusters. This one cost almost $200 million, probably over that, with all the marketing costs. And I just think they're playing it safe with the sequels. Uh, they want it to, to ensure a return on investment. And they know that uh, for $200 million in the first weekend, they can make their money back. As Joe mentioned, this film made $715 million in its first weekend. So that makes it a safe investment. But Boy, there's just so much other material out there to, to mine. And, they, and it would have been nice if Spielberg and the people behind this particular film would have taken more risks with the storytelling. I don't mind sequels. Just, you know, The Godfather 2 is one of the best movies of all time, and that's a sequel. Right. The Empire Strikes Back is one of right. the best right. sci-fi sci movies of all time. That was a sequel. And it's because they took risks with the storytelling in that. They were innovative. And so... It's, it just seems like Hollywood just doesn't have the guts to, to uh, you know, stray a little bit from the tried and true and, and, and take some chances on, on new story approaches. Right, and I think this is probably a theme that Joe and I and, and Aldo, if you come back in the future, we're going to be talking about. Uh, Joe, what do you think? Uh, Hollywood uh, running out of ideas? I, I really think they are, John, and I think what they really have to get back to is there are so many good novels out there right now, amazingly mm -hmm. original books. And if Hollywood can start going back and, and reading some of these amazing pieces of literature, then they're going to find great inspiration and great stories that are, can be made into films. So and all I can say is Hollywood, start go to the library, check out a book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is there's tons of novels out there that they could uh, mine, you know, for uh, for new material, original stories. Uh, you know, it seems that mo most of that stuff is being done in, you know, in series, uh, television series, you know, is where most of the creative filmmaking is being done right now. You know, the serial on uh, venues like Hulu and Netflix. So uh, hopefully Hollywood could take a cue from that and, and, and get back on to, uh, you know, making some great original stuff, stuff we haven't seen, because I think that's what I'm really looking for. But uh, I liked it more than you guys. I like the gothic uh set pieces uh the frankenstein nature of the second half where the animals were being uh, spliced together was uh interesting but again it fell short of a, fell short of the mark and i know you guys agree right aldo yeah i definitely agree let me ask you a quick question did you like yeah. this one more than the first one the first uh, trilogy movie the one that uh, the 2015 jurassic world movie I actually like this one better. I'm, I'm kind of, uh, they're kind of both uh, on the same level for me. I know uh, yeah. Joe, Joe liked the first Jurassic World uh, yeah. a lot more than this one. But, but to me, uh, you know, I mean, I, I I didn't need to make the trip back to Jurassic World or Jurassic Park. You know, <laughs> five, five movies is more than enough, you know. Now uh, that I've seen, you know, all five, I have to see the sixth. Well, yeah, know. we're going to right. Vegas, baby, Vegas. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But of course, you know, I'm, I, I'm hoping that six is the end, kind of. Although yeah, that's I where agree. I'm at. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, um, so all right. So wrapping it up uh, for Box Office Bros. Although, tell us where the, uh, where the audience can find you. Well, if you love uh, Chicago Bears football, look for me at, at Bears Barroom. And if you want to hear my opinions on politics, uh, movies, um, what I had to eat, then follow me over at Aldo, at Aldo Barkeeper, A-L-D-O Barkeeper. 
Right, BearsBarroom.com is where you can find the DLB podcast. You can coming up soon. You'll be find, uh, hearing Joe and I on Fantasy Football Goon, also part of Bears Barroom Radio Network. Yeah. Joe, tell our audience where uh, they can find you. Uh, you can find me at Joe Mandel. And for fantasy football season and football season in general, you can find me and John at FFB Goon. Uh, we answer all fantasy football questions all season long. So we're ready for football, baby. Yeah. Right. And uh, find, follow me at Twitter at, at Santucci underscore John. And for Box Office Bros, sign it off. Thanks again, Aldo, for being with us. You bet. Good night, Alida. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, uh, thanks again for being my Box Office Bro. Anytime, bud. All right. We'll see you next time at the movies. <laughs>